Dinosaurs are pretty well known at this point. You may have heard of them. Most people think of bones when they hear about these kind of animals. Not knowing that there are specimens out there that aren't just bones, they're mummified. So I've thought that since I've taken a broad look into the group of ankylosaurs, I can now take a more specific look into one of the most fascinating ones, Borealopelta. Pelta. All the way back in 2011, miners who were working a site 20 miles north of Fort McMurray in Alberta came across something out of the ordinary sticking out of the rocks. Knowing that this was a fossil, they contacted the experts and Donald Henderson and Darren Tank arrived soon after to take a look at what they initially thought would be a plesiosaur. The sediments of this specimen was found in what is known as the Clearwater Formation, which are actually marine nearshore sediments from the Western Interior Seaway, an inland sea that divided North America in two during the late Cretaceous. After finding that it wasn't a plesiosaur though, a team was put together to extract the fossil from 8 metres or 26 feet up a cliff, taking two weeks to completely excavate it. From here, as is often the case, the real work began after the excavation, as what has been dubbed the Suncor specimen then took a whole six years to be fully removed from the matrix and studied, before it was named and put on display in 2017 as Boreal Apelta Mark Mitchelli. So what was this thing? Well, Boreal Apelta was, much like most ankylosaurs, a pretty large herbivore. This thing measured at around 5.5 metres or 18 feet in length, and around 1.3 tonnes in weight. Boreal Apelta was a typical nodosaur, which, as I mentioned in my ankylosaur video, was one of two branches of ankylosauria. Unlike the slightly bulkier club-tailed ankylosaurids, nodosaurs lacked a tail club, instead making up for it in more innate, abundant body armour. Boreal Apelta in particular sported closely spaced osteoderms, or skin bones, on the back and side of its body, running down its length in rows. These osteoderms were all relatively spiky, but the rows lining its neck and shoulders in particular formed long solid spines, ideal for clotheslining some poor theropod shins. And normally I'd stop there, but on some very rare occasions we can sell a lot more than just the hard mineralized parts. Boreal Apelta has actually joined the club for being one of the very few dinosaurs for which we actually know the colour of. Now I'll go into just how our paleontologists were able to figure this out, but first let's get into what we actually know. Boreal Apelta was a reddish brown colour across its top, with counter shading on its underside which was a light beige. Counter shading is something extraordinarily common in today's animals, and is essentially when the top side of the body is a noticeably darker colour than the underside with varying gradients. This pattern is actually a form of camouflage adopted in order to help break up the lines of an animal. Since light is usually coming down from the sky, the top of the animal is highlighted and the underside is cast in shadow. So counter shading does exactly what it says in the tin and counteracts this effect, evening up the amount of light and dark on the animal's body. And now don't get me wrong, this would hardly render the animal invisible, but it can make another animal question just what it's looking at for a second or two which is long enough to be the difference between a successful hunt and an unsuccessful hunt, whether you're predator or prey. This insight can also help us to surmise the kind of lifestyle that Boreal Apelta was living. But before we get into that, let's put it into context by looking at what kind of environment this animal was living in. Boreal Apelta was found in the Wabascore member of the Clearwater Formation, of which was actually laid in an offshore marine environment during the Albion stage of the early Cretaceous between 110 and 112 million years ago. Now I know what you're thinking, but Boreal Apelta was not a marine animal. Let me explain. During this time, North America was split in two by a vast shallow inland sea known as the Western Interior Seaway, with Appalachia to the east and Laramidia to the west. These particular sediments were laid down to the northern end of the sea, with paleontologists surmising that Boreal Apelta likely came from the Laramidian coast. Given that Boreal Apelta wasn't found in its own paleo environment, we can only take a guess at what animals it shared its environment with by looking at the closest terrestrial formations of the same age. This would include various small mammals and reptiles, along with dinosaurs such as Zephyrosaurus, Astrodon, Tenontosaurus, Sauroposeidon, and the famous theropods which have already got in their own videos, famous Deinonychus and the massive Acrocanthosaurus. So how exactly was it living in this environment? Well, like most ankylosaurs, Borealopelta was a low-slung herbivore that fed on the ferns that lined the wild grounds, 
with preserved stomach contents even showing that ferns were this poor guy's last meal, which was also seasoned with charcoal, meaning it was feeding after the recent recovery of a wildfire. But despite ankylosaurs having a reputation as nature's tanks, Borealopelta Pelta may have been more vulnerable than you might think. This nodosaur did have protection with that armour and those spikes which may have served a dual function as both defensive and display structures, but let's not forget that counter shading. Counter shading is only needed when you want to avoid being noticed and when you're a big protective herbivore that doesn't give a fuck. When an animal is a large protected herbivore that doesn't need to sneak up on anything and isn't really hunted by anything when they're on a dull, they don't need this feature. So this means that in with all that armour, Boreal Apelta wanted to avoid being seen by something. Sure, Boreal Apelta was big, but this is the Mesozoic. So is everything else. Acrocanthosaurus, for a start, wouldn't have really had much trouble feeding on this guy. It wouldn't exactly take much to flip it over using its specialised strength, which I talk more about here. Acrocanthosaurus is just a guess at a shared environment too. Who knows what other big theropods it had to avoid. If it was seen though, the spikes certainly would have come in handy. There's no reason that these weren't used for mating displays in some form or another, but the fact that these fossilised melanosomes don't show particularly bright colours means that defence was their primary role. And as I talked about more in my dinosaur colour video, melanosomes are special colour cells that can be preserved in fossils on very rare occasions. Speaking of melanosomes, we need to talk about taphonomy. Taphonomy is the study of everything that happens to an organism in between it dying and being discovered. It's a study mostly explored in paleontology and forensic sciences for obvious reasons, but it's also a subject I delved into a while back here. Please come back and click after you're done watching this. It doesn't have as many views, so it needs some love. Anyway, this is an incredibly important aspect on how we can tell so much about Borealopelta. Pelta. As I've already stated, an incredible amount was preserved with this dinosaur, including soft tissue in such detail that it preserved colour, and the way this happened is the speed and type of burying. Borealopelta Pelta was washed out into the western interior seaway probably during a flood, before being buried relatively quickly in somewhat fine sediment. Now the speed at which this dinosaur was buried is important here, because one of the fundamentals of taphonomy is that the quicker something is buried and protected from the elements, or from scavenging, whether that be microbial organisms or multicellular ones, the more exceptional that preservation will be. The holotype specimen of Borealopelta Pelta was protected both inside and out from the usual levels of decay and scavenging to become, in the loosest sense of the term, mummified. But uh, why don't we see this more often? Why did the stars align so perfectly for just Borealopelta Pelta to be preserved in such a way? Well, the initial idea and the one that has gained the most traction in recent years is what has been termed as the bloat and float model. You see, an important aspect to this preservation is the fact that this guy was buried upside down on his back, which the original researchers chalked up to death gases. When an animal dies, the countless amounts of microorganisms within its body continue to produce gases within for a little while. Now, in most smaller animals, the amount that's produced isn't really enough to make much difference before the body decays enough for it to gradually escape. In humans, and this will get a little dark, this has been known to make others think that an individual is still alive or has become supernaturally undead, because the cadaver will make sounds like it's trying to speak, sometimes being nicknamed the death rattle, when in fact it's just these gases escaping from a body that is very much an ex-person. In big animals though, this is where we see it to the extreme. Whales will famously, and Steph if you're watching this, I've looked it up and it is famous, whales will famously balloon up after death over the course of a few weeks before, uh, for lack of a better term, popping when the build up is too much. I'm not going to put any clips of it in case any of you are queasy, but you can look it up because it's as awesome as it is utterly gross. Anyway, the initial hypothesis for Borealopelta Pelta was that this happened and because of the top heavy armour, this nodosaur was floating along upside down for weeks before popping and sinking. A couple of problems that strike me here though. First of all, things are definitely going to have scavenged this carcass. If anyone has watched my Western Interior Seaway video, you'll know that there was all sorts of weird beasties of different shapes and sizes swimming around. 
Enough would have taken at least a light snack over the course of weeks that this specimen wouldn't have been above average with regards to soft tissue preservation. Secondly, and this is something that all of the sickos that watch whales exploding can attest to, myself included, when things do finally go pop, well, let's just say that the internal organs aren't exactly labelled and stacked neatly in a pile. But Borealopelta also shows exceptional preservation in its internal organs. A study performed in 2020 also pointed out another issue here in that in order for this to occur, ankylosaurs would need a body mass density similar to that of modern birds, which definitely was not the case. They proposed instead that the animal was actually still alive when it was washed out to sea, struggling to stay at the surface since, you know, this isn't exactly the body best suited for great swimming even without flooding currents, before it drowned and began sinking straight away. Ankylosaurs, especially nodosaurs, are very front heavy, which is probably what caused it to flip upside down as it sank, before it hit the seafloor with enough force to throw up a fair amount of sediment around it, spooking off many potential nearby benthic scavengers long enough for that sediment to settle back down over the body in a thick enough layer to form a siderite concretion, cocooning it and preserving it pretty close to how it was in life brings us nicely into this week's Q&A where I'll be answering a question from Josh the Mighty 9967 who has asked My question is do you think some Pleistocene megafauna could survive the Mesozoic alongside dinosaurs? Proboscideans, giant ground sloths, giant short-faced bears, Smilodon etc. Okay so I'm going to assume a hypothetical scenario that involves time travel rather than what if they just simply coexisted because with the non-aving dinosaurs around, mammals simply wouldn't have evolved to that sort of megafaunal level. Uh, but yeah, what if you picked up all these Pleistocene mammals and just dropped them in the middle of the Mesozoic? Would they survive? Uh, no. Okay, so there's several reasons for this. The Pleistocene fauna is what most of the general public would term the Ice Age animals. These are huge mammals that have evolved in a very cold world and have adaptations for conserving as much heat as possible, as well as for being able to take advantage of as much hard going vegetation as possible, which involves a lot of migration or being evolved to hunt very specific megafauna. Now all animals are a sign of the times, but this is especially true with the Pleistocene megafauna. But on the flip side, one big feature of the Mesozoic is what geologists have termed the Mesozoic greenhouse. This was one of the hottest times in Earth's history. So much so, temperatures and sea levels made most of Europe, including England, look like Caribbean islands. These Ice Age mammals, who have evolved gigantothermy, fur, and a whole slew of other different features specifically to stop them cooling down too much, would simply mean they overheat and eventually die. And that's before we even get into the competition with the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs have evolved and adapted to this kind of environment much better than Ice Age mammals, and there's no getting around this, they're just bigger. Now there's a reason that when we talk about giant mammals that we always say this was the biggest terrestrial animal that wasn't a dinosaur, or this mammal was as big as, insert fairly typically sized dinosaur here. Sure, there are a lot of small dinosaurs, but if we're looking at just megafauna, dinosaurs were simply bigger, which meant that whether you're talking about herbivores or carnivores, they could simply bully all those mammal incels away from food sources, which they certainly would need since they need more calories. So eating way more foods that they're just better adapted to eating, as well as being able to bully away any mammals for the remainder, would mean that the Pleistocene megafauna would get very hot and very hungry very quickly. But hey, dinosaurs wouldn't do as well in the Ice Age, so you don't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. Anyway, I hope that's answered your question as much as I hope that you have all enjoyed this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.